Hi, my name is Gilbert Muniz. I'm a fashion and surface design teacher from Houston, Texas. In this presentation, I'm going to show you how I work with soy wax batik. It's a simple process that yields amazing results, but does require a little bit of setup. So let's get started. Batik is a wax resist technique, meaning you're placing something on the fabric that will not accept dye or will not let the dye pass through. We start with a base color, cover it with wax, then over dye around the resist. The wax is then removed to reveal the color underneath. There are several batik waxes on the market, but I feel soy wax is the most approachable. Soy wax is relatively inexpensive and can be gotten at most major craft retailers online. It's made from a naturally grown plant fiber, and um, it does not require harsh chemicals to get it out of the fiber. You can just use hot water. When quilters hear the word batik, they think of a specific fabric in a quilt shop. It is tightly woven, stiff, and commercially available everywhere. However, batik is a surface design process and not a specific fabric. Batik can be done on any plant or protein fiber, even wool, although wool batik is a completely different process that I won't be covering in this presentation. Thinner fabrics are easier to work with uh, initially with soy wax. The wax comes out of the weave much easier when the fabric isn't terribly thick. All of the examples I do in this presentation are a standard muslin available at all major fabric retailers. Any of the processes I do in this presentation can be done on silk. I prefer working with 8 Momi Habotai silk, but feel free to experiment. Now to get started, let's look at some supplies. I wear disposable gloves for easier cleanup, and I always cover my work table in an old craft towel. Any old towel will work. I then layer two layers of plain butcher paper over the towels. These will absorb the excess wax as it passes through the fabric. The wax I use for batik is 444 soy wax, which is normally used for candles, but it works really well on fabric. I use an inexpensive electric frying pan to melt it. For batik stamps, you can use any metal or wood object. This is a dollar store potato masher. This is a funnel cake shaper I found on eBay. This is a small piece of aluminum armature wire I bent into a shape and covered the end with some toweling so I don't burn my hands when it gets into the hot wax. If you're handy with power tools, you can make your own wood stamps. This is a stripe stamp I made from some scrap wood. It's just cut pieces of wood nailed to a base. Dense car wash sponges can be carved into various shapes and used to make more rustic patterns. Kitchen cleaning sponges don't work as well. To begin stamping, you'll need to start with a pre-dyed, light colored fabric. Batik is a great way to use up uh, misprints or dye accidents that you weren't really happy with. Uh, and all the examples in this uh, presentation are going to be using flawed or misprinted fabric that um, I wasn't really happy with, so let's see what we can do with them. Soy wax melts between 120 and 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Do not go over 180 degrees or your wax will smoke. My frying pan has a warm setting that melts it perfectly. Then I dial it down to a consistent temperature for my printing. You'll need to understand your frying pan to get the perfect temperature. The wax should melt to a liquid and stay liquid as you work. When you're done printing, simply turn off the frying pan and leave the wax to cool in the pan. To reuse the wax, simply turn on the frying pan again and use a chopstick or a small piece of dowel to help break the wax up to melt it easier. Working close to the fabric, place your stamp in the melted wax and let it warm up for a minute. Decide how you want your pattern to work. I'm making an even design, so I'm starting on one end. This potato masher has a bend in it that needs to be twisted to get a consistent pattern. Shake off the excess wax over the pan. Then firmly press down where you want to place the design. Continue this process to get the design you want. You can do even patterns or make them completely random. Once your wax printing is complete, remove the fabric from the paper. If you see an imprint on the paper, your wax has penetrated the fiber completely. 
If not, you need to press down harder when you stamp, or the over dye will bleed through the wax. The wax dries in seconds, so you can just stack these on top of each other as you finish them. The paper can be used over and over again. I make my horizontal bias stripes by folding a 45 degree angle on my fabric. Then I print with my stripe block on the fold. This yields a bias stripe that looks horizontal even on a curved seam. This follows the exact same process as before for the stamping. Dip the stamp in the wax, shake off the excess, then following the fold, press on the fabric. Evenly space the print from one to the other, that way you get a continuous row of stripes. Once your design is complete, remove it from the paper and add it to the stack. To use the car wash sponge, soak up some wax and press a little excess off on the side. As you first stamp, press lightly but enough to penetrate the fiber. If you press too hard, you'll push too much wax into the fabric causing a big blob. Continue pressing slightly harder as you move up on your design. This will allow you to use the stamp more without having to constantly go back to the wax pot. Once your design is complete, add it to the stack. To use this vintage funnel cake shaper, I just stuck a chopstick in the center to use as a handle. You're going to follow the same process as before to use it. I like stray drips on my batik because it makes it look more handmade, but if you're worried about drips, what you can do is take a piece of paper or paper towel or something and just cover up the work that you've previously done. And it will catch most, if not all, the drips, although I still manage to get drips on my wax after putting down paper. However, if you're more careful than I am, you can easily get a very clean print when you stamp. To use an aluminum armature wire shape that you made, Grab a chopstick to help you push down the end for better penetration. Print your design as desired, and when you're done, remove it from the paper and throw it on the stack. Another tool you can use is a metal cookie cutter. Try to find one with a silicone lip on the top so you don't burn your hands while it's in the wax. Even a simple tool like a cheap paintbrush can make interesting designs with the wax. Wrap a rubber band on the handle to keep it from sliding into the wax as it rests on the edge. Once you're done with your wax stamping, it's time to over dye. I'm using what I call mid immersion dyeing. It uses just enough water to float the fabric, but not so much that it requires extra gallons of water. However, you can use any cold water immersion or direct application technique you want. For a detailed explanation of simple dyeing techniques, visit stitchingvulture.com for a free downloadable set of instructions for both cotton and silk. Gather your dye supplies and let's begin. In a separate container, soak the waxed fabric in cool water. Uh, this just helps the dye travel better over the fabric. Although this technique does account for some variance in, this, in the coverage, uh, the cold water bath just ensures that the bulk of the surface will be covered by dye. Next, we need to paste our dye. I want a dark over dye color, so I'm using a heaping tablespoon of dye powder. My fabric swatches are roughly fat quarter size, so the over dye will be very obvious. Using a plastic spoon, fold the dye into a small amount of water and stir until a thick paste is made. Once 
Once you've achieved a thick paste, you're going to add more water and stir to incorporate. In a plastic container big enough to soak the fabric, add a few inches of water or enough water to cover the fabric. You're going to dump in your pasted dye, stirring to incorporate. Add more water to the dye cup, stir to incorporate any particles from the bottom, and then pour this into the dye bath. Once all the dye water has been emptied into the bath, you want to stir the dye bath very well to make sure that all the dye has been incorporated into the water. Gently place your fabric into the dye bath, uh, being sure to soak the entire piece with dye water. Lightly press down to ensure you get decent coverage or let it sit undisturbed in the dye bath to get a more mottled effect. Here I am distributing the dye as much as I can and you can see how the wax resists the dark dye. I typically dye a few pieces in one dye bath but use as much water and dye powder per piece as you want. It's really up to you. I just soak one piece on top of the other in the bath. For a cracked effect in the wax, all you have to do is crush and scrunch the dry wax as desired. The more you crush, the more cracks you'll get. When you achieve your desired results, simply place it in the dye bath to soak. Once you have soaked all of your wax fabric in the dye bath for about 10 to 15 minutes, you need to add the soda ash. Be sure to make your soda ash well in advance or when you begin stamping so it's cool for the dye bath. I add about two to four cups of soda ash water to small dye baths like these, but follow manufacturer's instructions if desired for your particular dye bath. Here I am adding the cool soda ash water to the dye bath. You can move the fabric out of the way before you pour in the soda water, but I typically don't because I like the modeled variants in color. Once it's added, work the soda ash water into the fabric to distribute it. You can move it around as much or as little as you want, depending on the desired color effect. Do this to all dye baths you're working with. Let your over-dyed fabric sit for one to two hours. Soda ash breaks down soy wax, so if you leave it in too long, you'll negate your wax stamping, but feel free to experiment. If you're dyeing silk with soda ash, you can strip the luster of the fiber if you leave it in longer than a couple of hours. Once the one to two hours is up, you'll need to remove the wax. To begin, fill a plastic container with a boiled kettle of water. I use one plastic container that is dedicated to removing wax. Wring out as much dye as possible over the dye bath. Carefully place the fabric in the boiled water. Since a boiled kettle is more than 180 degrees, the wax will easily melt off with a little agitation. Use a stick to move the fabric around the tub. Agitate for a few minutes to release as much wax as possible. I've sped up the footage here so you can see the wax film that forms on top of the water. Protecting your hands with dishwashing gloves, remove the fabric from the tub and wring out as much liquid as possible. On this piece, I got some folding on the fabric in the dye bath, so there's obvious variance in the over dye. I'm okay with this because I like unique fabric. But if you want to avoid this, agitate your fabric more in the initial over dye soaking. I use the boiled water bath until it cools down enough to where it doesn't remove the wax. Then I flush it down the toilet, boil a new kettle, and continue rinsing my pieces. Once you have wrung out as much wax as you can from the fabric, you need to wash your fabric in the washing machine. I use an all-hot water cycle to do this. In the water, I put about a tablespoon of soda ash and enough Synthropol detergent based on the weight of the fabric. 
The Synthropol helps to remove any unbonded dye particles from the fabric. I typically wash three full cycles like this to make sure the fabric is properly rinsed, but rinse as much as you want or need to. Now let's look at the final rinsed and pressed results. This is the paintbrush over dyed with a dark green. Notice how subtle the color variance is when the undercolor and the over dye are analogous. This is the potato masher over dyed with the same green. Flipping the stamp gave us a continuous pattern. This is the homemade armature wire shape over dyed with the same dark green. You can see where the fabric folded over itself in the dye bath, resulting in a lighter but still over dyed section. This is the funnel cake shaper over dyed with a subtle black. Notice how you can still see the under dye streaks because they are a slightly darker value than the over dye. This is the stripe stamp set on the bias over dyed in the same black. You can see the dye bleeding through the cracks. This is the snowflake cookie cutter over dyed with a deep violet. There are small cracks in this one as well because the thin lines of wax cracked in the dye bath as it was agitated. This is the sponge over dyed in the same violet. Notice how different color over dyes will react with various under dyes to yield interesting color combos. This is a small table topper I made of striped and circle printed batik fabric. The stripes were set on the warp grain and stripes done like this make great straight edge bindings. This fusible applique skull was set on a circle printed batik fabric. The various values of the printed batiks give the applique uh, the illusion of dimension. The bias printed stripes stay horizontal as they curve around a corner. This table topper is a wild mix of several different batik prints. You can have a lot of fun mixing and matching your prints into small projects like this if you experiment with different colors and stamps as you dye. Don't be afraid to have fun with this technique. Half of the excitement is not knowing how the under dye and over dye will react to one another. You can also see here how the bias printed stripes stay horizontal even around crazy curves like this. I hope you have enjoyed this presentation. Visit me at stitchingvulture.com for more batik examples and other samples of my surface design work. And if you have any questions about what was presented today, email me at the address on the screen.